Amazing Grace by Kenneth Malchin. We have a tradition at our Celestis Memorial Services. There's a particular poem that, that we like to have read, and it's called, You Want a Physicist to Speak at Your Funeral. 
I'm going to ask John Dodonna to step forward and recite it to you. You want a physicist to speak at your funeral, a poem by Aaron Freeman. You want a physicist to speak at your funeral. You want the physicist to talk to your grieving family about the conservation of energy, so they will understand that your energy has not died. You want the physicist to remind your sobbing mother about the first law of thermodynamics, that no energy gets created in the universe and none is destroyed. You want your mother to know that all your energy, every vibration, every BTU of heat, every wave of every particle that was her beloved child remains with her in this world. You want the physicist to tell your weeping father that amid energies of the cosmos, you gave as good as you got. And at one point, you'd hope that the physicist would step down from the pulpit and walk to your broken-hearted spouse there in the pew and tell them that all the photons that ever bounced off your face, all the particles whose paths were interrupted by your smile, by the touch of your hair, hundreds of trillions of particles have raced off like children, their ways forever changed by you. And as your widow rocks in the arms of a loving family, Maybe the physicist will let them know that all the photons that bounced from you were gathered in the particle detectors that are their eyes. That those photons created within them constellations of electromagnetically charged neurons whose energy will go on forever. And the physicist will remind the congregation of how much of all our energy is given off as heat. Now, there may be a few fanning themselves with their programs as he says this, and he will tell them that the warmth that flowed through you in life is still here, still part of all that we are, even as we who mourn continue the heat of our own lives. And you'll want the physicist to explain to those who loved you that they need not have faith. Indeed, they should not have faith. Let them know that they can measure, that scientists have measured precisely the conservation of energy and found it accurate, verifiable, and consistent across space and time. You can hope your family will examine the evidence and satisfy themselves that the science is sound and that they'll be comforted to know your energy is still around. According to the law of the conservation of energy, not a bit of you is gone. You're just less orderly. Amen. And now, if I can bring your attention to the uh, back of the room again, we're going to do the introduction of the colors and military honors brought to us by VFW Post 4643.
The first fold represents one, one nation under God, that no other flag shall be flown above this flag, and let it be known that the honor of every one of our fallen military members shall rest below this flag. Fold two, the second fold, represents our forefathers, foremothers, and original patriots of our country, without whom we would not be a nation today. This fold will forever remind us of them and their sacrifices to ensure the freedoms we live every day. Fold three. This fold is the fold of the oath which every soldier, marine, sailor, airman, guardian, and coast guardsman takes upon entering the United States military, a solemn vow to our nation to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign or domestic, that they will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. Fold four is for those that have been and remain deployed to all corners of the earth. Our military forces selflessly leave their loved ones behind to go where they are called without hesitation. These veterans did this for our country. They fought on foreign soil. They knew the importance of this fold. Fold five. This is the fold of leaders, without which we would not survive as a nation. It is for those service members that had the strength when the situation demanded it, determination when everything felt lost, and devotion, courage, and patriotism when others looked to them for guidance. Fold six, the promise fold. The promise of these veterans to always stand tall and strong against oppression and fight for the freedom to enable our citizens to live their lives free from tyranny and fear. With this fold, these veterans swore, not just to our nation, but to those that served alongside every day. Fold seven. This fold is for the over 1.3 million service members who have lost their lives in battle since we became a nation. This fold is centered between the 13 folds, encased directly halfway between the first and last fold, six before, six after. This is the heart of the flag. This is the heart of our nation. Fold eight. This fold represents those that serve directly with these veterans. Whether they are with us in life or preceded these veterans in death, these are the folds of a service men and women's circle, which is eternal. The number eight represents infinity. With this fold, a bond of inclusion was made between those that have served together that can never be broken and remains infinite. Fold nine. This is the fold of memories. Memories of these veterans, their laughters, smiles, and voices forever etched into those that knew them. These veterans will be remembered. Fold 10. This fold represents the future. For the passing of these veterans represents that the freedoms of this nation, with the weight once carried by these veterans, has been passed to the next generation of those serving. The weight has now been accepted with this fold. Fold 11, the fold of love. The two ones in this number mirror each other, as in life and love. This fold represents the love in both these veterans' lives and those here today that loved and respected these veterans. Prayers that someday all will find comfort in having known and loved these veterans and the memories you shared with all of them. Fold 12, the fold of tears. Though bitter, this fold is for the mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, family members, and spouses of these patriots, for they have known them the longest, the best, and the truest. With that, this fold shall only precede the final, because nothing else can be said for the grief you all feel. Fold 13, the final fold. The last fold seals the flag. There is neither beginning nor any end now. This fold re represents the bond that all of these veterans who had bravely donned our nation's uniform and committed to something bigger than themselves will forever be part of in life and the ever after. They will always be remembered as a military member. They will forever be part of the fraternal order, forever be our brothers and sisters. They will be remembered.
On behalf of a grateful nation and the veterans of foreign wars, we would like to symbolically present this flag to all the families whose loved ones so faithfully and honorably served our nation. May they all rest in peace. This concludes our presentation. Thank you. Celestis would like to say a, a great big thank you to the VFW Post 4643 for that touching uh, tribute and salute to our veterans on board the Enterprise and Tranquility flights. Thank you. I'd like to bring up our founder and CEO, Charlie Chafer, uh, to introduce our guest speaker, Curling, Colonel Eileen Collins. Charlie? Colby mentioned traditions of our Celestis, and now that we're on our 19th and 20th missions, one of the most special traditions that we have is to recognize that your loved ones are going to space. Who better to talk to you than someone who has been there, who's experienced directly what your loved ones will experience symbolically and vicariously. Before I introduce Colonel Collins, I want to note that uh, we originally had scheduled Fred Hayes, Apollo 13 and shuttle astronaut to speak to you. Uh, Fred unfortunately took a fall and um, is unable to attend. The good news is he's recovering and for a 90 year old plus man, he sounded really good. He asked for those of you who brought book plates that you wanted to have him sign for his book. If you'll just leave them with us, We'll make sure that they get to him and that he'll sign them and we'll get the book plates back to you. Um, it's really a pleasure to, for me and for all of us to welcome Colonel Eileen Collins to speak to you. The first woman to pilot and command an American spacecraft, astronaut Eileen Collins has had an inspiring life of adventure, leadership, and achievement. As a child, she dreamed of becoming a pilot. Her parents nurtured that dream when taking her to Elmira's soaring field to watch gliders take flight. Reading every book she could on aviation, Collins began saving up money for flying ages, flying ages, flying lessons at the age of 16. After graduating from Syracuse University, which as a Georgetown alum, we won't hold that against her. Uh, Collins entered the Air Force undergraduate pilot training program. In 1990, she was selected for NASA's astronaut program. And in February 1995, on the STS-63 Discovery mission, she became the first woman to ever pilot a space shuttle. She piloted STS-84 Atlantis in May of 97, and in July 99, she achieved another milestone 
when she became the first woman ever to command a shuttle mission. STS-93, Columbia. STS-93, Columbia. After flying one final NASA mission in July 2005 as commander of STS-114 Discovery, Collins retired. Now that she's realized her dreams of being both a pilot and an astronaut, she has a new dream that someday people will discover new ways to fly higher, faster, and farther, and that someday we will travel beyond the solar system. Recognized as one of America's most admired women, she now shares her experiences as a test pilot, astronaut, and spaceflight commander with audiences around the world. She also served on the National Space Council, which is the White House Space Policy Leadership organization and has been a board member for the Astronaut Memorial Foundation, which by the way, if you have some free time, it's just down the road, it's a very compelling uh, memorial. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Colonel Eileen Collins. Well, thank you, Charles. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. And I would like to welcome everyone to Florida. I wanted to say sunny Florida, but tomorrow it'll be sunny Florida. Now, this is off script. I want to make a remark right at the very beginning spontaneously. I am so glad I'm here because I was listening to your stories this morning. And I just want to say it is so inspirational to me to hear the stories of your loved ones. And it's motivational for me to keep doing things in life as I get older and the years go by uh, to try to always uh, be better and do better uh, and continue to set a good example to people. So thank you for your stories. I know it's hard to come up here at the podium and speak, but. Uh, it's worth it. In a little over 36 hours, you're going to see the inaugural launch of the Vulcan rocket in the Centaur upper stage. This launch is a really, really big deal. And for those of you that work in the aerospace industry, you know what I mean. This rocket has been in development for many, many years. I think it's been almost 10 years in the works. And a lot of people are going to be paying attention to this. The rocket itself is very important to the United States, our national security, international cooperation, as well as humanity's growth, our economic growth into space, into Earth orbit, lunar space, and deep space uh, to Mars and beyond. And I know that you are going to enjoy your experience. And I, that is a huge understatement. I really can't put words to it. Maybe the best would be to uh, give you an example. I worked here at Kennedy Space Center back in the early 1990s, and that was before my space flights. I would say the experience here is magical. That's the word that I would use to describe it. It's better than a theme park because it's the real world. It's a real mission. So back then, in the early 1990s, and even now, I loved watching the missions launch. It is a powerful feeling. First, you're going to see the engine's light. And many seconds later, you'll hear the noise. And as you all know, light travels faster than sound. And let's say, for example, if you're 10 miles away from the launch, it'll take me, you know, it, maybe eight to 10 seconds for you to hear anything. So just wait for that. It's a whole body experience, uh, what you see, what you hear, what you feel, even what you smell. I remember watching my friends launch into space. Uh, many times I would be a family escort or an extended family escort and I'd, I'd be with the spouses and the children and the extended family members in fact, I often would turn and photograph the faces of the children as they watched their parent launch and ascend into space. 
Every time there were hoots and hollers, you know, people would be covering their face. Uh, there'd even be tears. Uh, people held hands, they hugged, and they smiled. And as a young, unflown astronaut, I was there to provide strength and guidance to the family. Um, but honestly, it was an emotional experience, really an overpowering experience uh, for me also. So I thought what I would do uh, today is talk a little bit about what it feels like to be on board. Because eventually, I had the opportunity to fly my own missions. I went up four times. So what does it feel like to launch into space? Of course, as a pilot and commander, I was busy uh, laying on my back. We'd lay on our back for you know three to four hours, depending on uh, what the mission was. It felt really great at first, but after a while, the back starts hurting. Um, but we were busy. We're running checklists. We're throwing switches. We're checking our gear. We're talking to the launch control center and watching the clock count down. And as the clock counted down, your heart starts beating faster. Try to control it. but your heart still starts beating uh, pretty fast, knowing that this launch was about to begin. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7. T minus six seconds on the space shuttle, the main engines lit. And the whole stack would start to rumble. It was like an earthquake. And it would sound like you were in a room that was burning, a room on fire. T minus three, to one, and at T minus zero, the booster's lit. And what happens at that moment is there's a jerk, the hold down posts, by the way, there were eight hold down posts that were, each of them was about that big, that held the six and a half million pounds on the launch pad. And then they would break, hopefully they did, they would break, and then you'd have seven and a half million pounds of thrust lift you off the pad. And the tower was about 250, uh, feet, and by the time, if you looked out the window and you saw the tower go by, no, we weren't sinking, <laughs> we were going up, and we were over 100 miles an hour by the time we passed 250 feet, and the acceleration was incredible, but mostly in first stage when the boosters were burning, there's a lot of shaking going on, and if you tried to handwrite something on your kneeboard, <laughs> During first stage, you'd never be able to read it because it would be a big mess. That, there's that so much shaking. And by the way, I've launched in February, March, and July, twice in July. There's a jet stream in the winter. Y'all know what the jet stream is. And when the shuttle or any launch vehicle goes through the jet stream, the gimbling is trying to keep the stack in a certain position. And there's a lot of slamming back and forth. And that's just expected. And that's what causes a lot of the shaking. So there's more of that in February in winter launches, and my summer launches were very smooth, a big difference. Another thing I want to mention about what you feel in the first stage is the G-load. Two and a half Gs, after the boosters separate, you accelerate up to three Gs, which you'll have from about four minutes to eight and a half minutes. Now, most people know what a G is, but the way I describe it, you know, a G is for gravity. Here on the surface of the Earth, we experience one G, one unit of gravity. But when you're under three Gs, you know, the launch vector, because you're laying on your back, the launch vector goes through your chest. In an airplane, it goes down your spine. But in a launch vehicle, the G vector goes through your chest. If you, let's say for round numbers, you weigh 100 pounds here on Earth. If you could step on a weight scale during a shuttle launch, at three Gs, it would register 300 pounds on the weight scale, and that's how much force you have on your body. And most launch vehicles are at about three Gs. Uh, you could go more, but there's structural limitations to that. So that's what you feel. And then at MECO, which is M-E-C-O, main engine cutoff, everything instantly goes to zero gravity. But it's not like stepping on the brakes in a car where you get thrown forward. There's none of that. You instantly go to zero G. So you're under all this stress, pressure, force, and then zero gravity. And the, the magical thing about it is everything starts floating. Uh, my lanyards were floating. My checklist pages were fanning out. 
the ring around my collar is floating up around my ears. And my first launch was a night launch. And the sun started coming in the cabin. And you'd see all this dust. It was like a snowstorm, the dust floating around. Eventually, the filters and the fans clear that out. But it's like you're in a snowstorm. And by the way, I had a seventh grader tell me last spring that the earth was flat. Seventh grader. And I am here to tell you the earth is round. <laughs> because I looked out the window and yes, the earth is round. I don't know what they're, what they're thinking, but or who's talking to these? But the earth, yeah, you go around it once every 90 minutes when you're in low earth orbit. And you get 16 sunsets and sunrises a day when you're in low earth orbit. So that's just kind of in a nutshell what it feels like to go through the launch. I could go on and on. Uh, what does it feel like to be in microgravity? I, I thought what I would do is I have a very short uh, video, runs about eight minutes of my last mission, and I thought, I thought you'd enjoy seeing that. So uh, let's go ahead and run that video. This was STS-114. Uh, there were a crew of seven of us. I was the commander, and our goal was to rendezvous and dock with the uh, International Space Station, uh, which at the time had only two people on board. And we were the first launch after the tragic uh, accident of Columbia. So there was a lot on the line for this. And we were really a test flight for new techniques that were going to be used in the future to keep the shuttle safer. So here's the launch countdown uh, over here on the left screen that I uh, described earlier. And when we lifted off, my first thought was, there's a lot of really happy people <laughs> down there watching. We had cameras everywhere. There were almost, I would say, 80 to 90 cameras around the launch pad viewing everything. Uh, this is uh, the shuttle on the top. There's the uh, boosters on the bottom. You can see the beach over here. There's one of the launch pads. This is uh, about two minutes and 10 seconds. Uh, the cameras on the booster, where they uh, separate, and of course they were reused all throughout the shuttle program. They came down in parachutes and they were uh, picked up by uh, the two boats that towed them back in. But we continued on up to orbit. That's the orange tank where our fuel was on the bottom, and there's a shuttle on the top. Uh, we automatically separated at about eight and a half minutes, and we went up. And we uh, did a series of burns to rendezvous us with the space station. Uh, this view here is of myself and Jim Kelly, my pilot, who flew the uh, on-orbit burns to bring us to the space station on flight day three. Now, this maneuver was called the rendezvous pitch around maneuver, RPM maneuver. We're 600 feet below the space station. And the uh, two crew members videotaped us the whole goal of that RPM maneuver was to photograph and see if there was any damage on the shuttle because that was the cause of the accident two years earlier. Uh, that's what the space station looked like uh, back then. It's about twice as big now. If you look at the top up here, it's kind of hard to see, but I was looking out the window as, you know, we actually hand flew all the dockings with the space station. We connected at 0.2 feet per second, very, very slow. And then it took about 45 minutes to equalize the pressure and open the hatch. Now, the commander at the time was Sergei Krikalov. And he's on the left over there in the light blue. And on uh, the right in the light blue is John Phillips, the science officer. He's a geologist uh, by trade. Uh, my crew is in the dark blue shirt. That's Andy Thomas. Uh, he's from Australia. Uh, Wendy Lawrence, uh, she's a Navy captain. There's Jim Kelly, my pilot. I had an absolutely fantastic crew, and we always said the best thing about our missions were the people that you flew with and the people that you worked with. And this was our welcome ceremony. This is the US laboratory. Uh, obviously, it's still up there now. Uh, we have uh, usually seven to 11 people working from all different countries, working on board the space station. Um, here, Andy and Wendy are just showing how we do the transfer of uh, materials to the station. Uh, this is Soichi in the middle, in the back is Steve Robinson. They did the three spacewalks on the flight. While Wendy and Jim flew the robot arm, an interesting thing about the robot arm is you cannot actually see what you're doing. You use laptop computers and cameras and monitors to 
actually fly the robot arm. It moved, I want to call it a big crane, moving things around in space. On flight day five, Steve and Soichi did their very first spacewalk. And although they had trained for many, many years, it's still a big deal going out on their first spacewalk. So my job as commander was to get them ready mentally. So I went in the airlock and I said, OK, boys, you have six hours. You need to be back in time for dinner. And just to kind of like, that's why they always called me mom. That was, some, they didn't call me colonel or captain, they called me mom. So these are views of the three spacewalks. Now, it's really hard for people to watch these because obviously you're in zero G and things are upside down, right, left, backwards, forwards, and it's, you don't know what the equipment is. But I just want to point out a couple of things on the spacewalks by mentioning the one that we did in the middle. There's these big devices called gyroscopes, four of them on the space station. And the purpose is to hold the space station in a certain attitude so it doesn't spin out of control. Well, one of those four had failed. And if you look right here, if you can see the left screen, that big black cylinder, okay, this is Soichi in the white. There's, he looks like a little Lego man, right? There's his feet stuck to the robot arm, but he is holding the CMG, the, I'm sorry, he's holding the gyroscope. Okay, here, here he is again. There's the gyroscope, there's Soichi, there's his feet, there's the arm. That thing weighs 600 pounds on Earth, but in space it's weightless. So he was able to hold it for 45 minutes while he was moved from the shuttle up to the station effortlessly. And that's one of the benefits of uh, space flight is it doesn't weigh anything. But don't let go of it because <laughs> you're in trouble. <laughs> you don't want it to float away. Uh, this is just some scenes from our last spacewalk. Uh, Steve had a helmet camera, and he removed this gap filler uh, popped out between those tiles and the engineers were worried on the way back that those uh, gap fillers, since they were sticking out in the wind stream, they might rip a tile out. So they asked Steve to go under. He, he was actually here under the nose of the shuttle and he pulled out those, there were two of them, pulled out those gap fillers. And that's just a view. Uh, we put them in a Ziploc bag and wanted to downlink some video to the engineers. They were all excited about this. So we sit up there until, I think this was maybe flight day 10, and we said goodbye to the station crew. We had a welcome ceremony when we got there, and then we had a departure ceremony leaving. You can see, uh, you know, we put a little sticker on the wall, we signed the logbook, and we get our name up there, it's kind of cool. And this was uh, the, what the space station looked like after we separated and did a fly around. There's the living area, of course the solar arrays, the space station is completely powered by solar. Uh, those other panels that you see out there are radiators uh, that are used to cool the electronics. And back when we were there, the space station was about, the interior was about the size of five school buses end to end. And now it's about twice as big. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's a burn, these guys are goofing off here. I said, okay, everybody, lock everything down, we're doing a burn, and so they turned the camera on. Uh, this are sleeping bags. Uh, you can sleep on anywhere you want. Sleep on the ceiling, the wall, the floor. Uh, here we are coming home. Uh, that pink out the window is the plasma that develops. You know, we get, we are very fast, uh, 25 times the speed of sound. Uh, this is an infrared view here, so it's, the shuttle is glowing because it's hot. It infrared uh, shows the heat. You can see how hot the nose is there. And we, uh, do our deorbit burn about an hour before landing, uh, pretty much over on the other side of the planet, over the uh, Pacific, or actually over the Indian Ocean, we do the deorbit burn. And it, uh, the whole thing takes about an hour to come back. We uh, take over manually. The, every landing has been hand flown by the commander. We give the pilot a little bit of stick time. But right over Kennedy Space Center at about 50,000 feet, we would take over manually, and that was right when the shuttle went subsonic. So you're, as you come back, you're going Mach 25, 24, 23, you're slowing down. How do we slow down while we're hitting the atmosphere, going very fast, the friction from those, I want to say molecules in the upper atmosphere, hit the 
tiles in the heat shield, that's why we heat up and slow down. And we go into a bank, and that actually aids in descending the shuttle uh, back to Earth. So we take over manually uh, right above the runway. We fly a heading alignment cone. And we come down final at about 300 miles an hour, about twice as fast as a commercial airliner and about three times steeper because we didn't have engines to go around. We did have a speed brake to control our energy if we get too high or too low, but we weren't able to actually go around if we missed the runway. So it was, took a lot of training, very uh, careful <laughs> coming back, that mostly because the commanders that land the shuttle like to compare their landings to the other commanders to see who put it on the spot how close were you to the center line, and were you on speed? So we won't talk about that now, but I had a chance to do two of them. So uh, lots of more fun things about uh, space flight. It is such a wonderful experience, and it's my hope that more and more people have the opportunity to fly in space someday. You know, we're living in a time like the early Wright brothers for airplanes, where we are in space right now. It's a uh, expensive business. There's risk involved, and we need to do it safely, and we need to do it right. So we, I get upset that it takes so long, but I think if you're going to do it right, you got to uh, have patience. So we're seeing space open up, and that's a very, very good thing. And I'd like to end by saying um, I know that your loved ones had a deep love of space exploration. Uh, they knew the excitement of the incredible adventures in the mystery of space, uh, both fiction and nonfiction. You know, I understand, because I grew up as a kid with a love of Buck Rogers, I watched Star Trek, I watched Star Wars, I watched all of them. Um, I read Isaac Asimov, I read Arthur Clarke, I read the, the brilliant science fiction writers. I don't remember them all because I was checking them out of the library, and uh, like a good student, I returned them, but I wish I had written down the name of all the books I read. Um, but I was inspired to study things that I did not understand and to search for meaning in our world. These are the things, I believe, that bond us together, our search for meaning. And I'm so happy for all of you that you're having this experience uh, here and now. And here you're going to make friendships that will last a lifetime. And I know you'll take with you memories for yourself and for your loved ones that will stay with you forever. So my wishes, my best wishes to you, and my hopes and prayers are with you on this mission. And I know that you will have a wonderful experience. Godspeed, and thank you. Thanks. about that? That was cool, huh? <laughs> I've met a, several astronauts, worked for some, worked with others. Invariably, they take great joy in sharing the experience that they had with all of us, and thanks for the delightful presentation. The good news is Colonel Collins will be back with us at 4 o'clock, back where the blue curtain is for a reception honoring her, where she's graciously agreed to take selfies and sign stuff, so, uh, <laughs> which we appreciate greatly. She'll also be hanging around at dinner tonight, so I encourage you, she's a delightful person, and uh, please take an opportunity to meet her and tell her uh, what a great job she did for the nation. <clears throat> so now we're gonna take a five minute break because we're gonna to transition to the Tranquility Flight. This is the first Celestis mission that's ever had two missions on one rocket. And uh, boy, has that been an experience for us. <laughs> but uh, for those of you who are here for Enterprise and for Colonel Collins, uh, you're welcome to stay, but we're gonna be focusing on the moon in five minutes. Thank you.